Sunday morning, you're all here. Those that are serious about making change, get up on Sunday mornings and you can. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Bob Bryan. I'll be moderating this panel. Uh, the, the format will be that each speaker will speak for 15 or 20 minutes. Um, I have some prepared questions to ask, but most of you would like to have the audience participate and ask questions. Um, often questions require some context, um, and, and it's not just one sentence, but we would ask you to the extent that you can, to please frame your questions clearly and concisely in uh, two or three minutes uh, at, at, in length. Um, with respect to, uh, so you know a little bit about me, my history is that I majored in English undergraduate. In 1973, I came to New York to go to the Useful for Social Research, which at that time they called the graduate faculty. When I arrived in 1973, it was 40 years after the University in Exile was formed, uh, which became the new school. The University in Exile um, uh, brought in a lot of European intellectuals because of the, the rise of fascism um, in Europe. Uh, and when I went to the new school in 73, I studied critical theory, and we read Habermas, Adorno, and Lukács. Uh, also, a person with the Hunt Arendt, and Arendt, as you know, covered the uh, Leibniz trial for the New Yorker, and she wrote a book. And in that book, she talked about the banality of evil, right? Which is, it's not a particular group that's capable of, of, of being evil and doing evil things. We all have that capacity. And the, the connection here is that as, as capitalism becomes extreme and the, the disparity of wealth becomes extreme, um, it leads more toward fascism, much like Europe. And this is, this, these are accurate parallels. And so it's, it's, it is important to talk about these things, to talk about fascism, to talk about what inequality means. So I went to graduate school and I couldn't get a job. And then I went to law school and I've been practicing law for 40 years. Um, <clears throat> Professor Rick Wolf, you, you all know Rick, um, and I don't mean to be telling you anything that you don't know. My, my only uh, goal here is to speak about three minutes and, and tie the three speakers together for now. Um, Rick has been, has been writing books for us and speaking to us most recently on economic update on a regular basis to provide, to pull back the veil um, on the capitalist matrix of this country so that we can begin to understand how it works. And if we don't understand how it works, we won't find a path forward. And that, that capitalist structure is supported by both power and myth. And the power is embedded in structures that exist both political, economic, and social and cultural. Um, <clears throat> And most classically, uh, those myths are intended to explain the, the gross inequality. And, and most typically, those people at the top of the hierarchy are the wealthy and they're the heroes of the story. And they're the ones who write the stories. And the working class and the poor and the oppressed are those that are labeled criminals. Right? And that's the, the hierarchy. What capitalism does, and has done, is to assign value to human life. And that value is based on, on essentially a um, uh, a hierarchy uh, that we understand now as a white supremacist hierarchy, and um, that has caused enormous harm. When, when there's gross inequality and people are suffering, and the suffering is profound, it causes enormous harm to everybody in this room and everybody that's subjected to that kind of system. And this is where uh, Dr. Harriet Fraud enters the picture. Harriet is a Marxist therapist. She's been a writer, she's written books, she's been a speaker, she speaks, and she speaks about the most intimate aspects of human relationships, and that most typically is with the family and other kinds of uh, relationships as they, as they exist in this society. And Harriet will, will describe for you the harm caused by an extraction economy um, that, 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 uh, that, uh, that harms everyone here. Um, so this, this brings us to the back of the structures of the, the, the society. And in this society in the United States, we look at as slavery, right? And, and we can't look at class while looking at, at race in this country. 
since slavery, they've been aligned to the poor communities um, in, in this society. And those, those communities are poor not by accident. And race, racism is not an accident. Those communities are poor because since slavery, um, there, there, there's been various structures, which, which Dr. Westcott will explain, um, that, have, that have kept people of color at the bottom of that hierarchy. In, in a capitalist society, there's always a hierarchy. Um, and that's been basically a, a, a racial hierarchy. But what I wanted to say is the movement for Black Lives Matter is made for a reason, right? And if you're a person of color, you think black lives didn't matter. And to some extent, white lives didn't matter either. And, and, but white lives have always been better than black lives. And so all those lives matter, but in this society it's really important to then I stay raised and talk about that. Because you should make no mistake about this, there'll be no movement for social justice or equality without addressing race in this society. Um, and Dr. Westcott uh, was a lawyer and went to graduate school because law for her uh, didn't allow her enough participation to do the kinds of things that she wanted to do. So we'd like to open up the discussion with uh, Rick Wolf. Bob and thank all of you for coming and share Bob's admiration that however seductive it might have been to go to church, you didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you came here instead. It shows extraordinary insight and commitment. Okay. Um, my task in the time I have is to try to provide a sense of how the economy uh, affects the American people. And the capitalist system is, I believe, and I don't say this often, uh, in a period of crisis. Um, capitalism has ways to work its way through these crises, has done that repeatedly. So it would be foolish to imagine that it's the end. On the other hand, every system goes through crises, and eventually one of them is the end. So while I'm not sure this might be the end, it might. And there are some reasons to wonder whether or not this time there is a way out. And I'll come back to that uh, at the end. How does the capitalist system in its current US form shape our lives? And uh, that's a big question. I'm going to focus on three ways that it currently affects us. The first way is summarized by the term exploitation. It's literally a, a description of how your job shapes your life. The, you know, your job, the thing you do five days a week in most cases, or you did if you're retired. The best five days of each week, the best hours of those five days, adults spend an extraordinary amount of their time at work. So if I can describe something that's really horrendous that goes on on the job every day, you're going to be deeply affected by it. And your personal relationships, as Harriet will talk about later, will be deeply affected by it. So what is exploitation? It is not the common sense definition. It's not about being badly treated. That folks aren't nice to you or make you sweat or fill you with anxiety. Jobs often do that, but that's not what, what exploitation means. <clears throat> exploitation is a very specific, simple thing. And the best way I can describe it is to give you a simple numerical example. Imagine yourself going to look for a job. Perhaps you were a young person some time ago, you did that, and you sat down with a prospective employer, and he or she went through the work you would be doing if you got the job. And then you got to that money part. The moment when the employer says to you, uh, 
this is how much you can pay, or maybe even answer to how much do you want. And you answer, let's assume just for simplicity, that you answer $20 per hour. And let's assume that, the, that your employer smiles and says, okay, I'm going to pay you $20 an hour. You know what I'm about to tell you, even if it hasn't occurred to you in quite these words. You know that in the private sector, which is where most of us work, the overwhelming majority, the employer produces some good or some service and sells it into the market. And that employer is never, ever going to hire you for $20 an hour unless the following sentence is true. During each hour that you work, you add more to the value of what your employer sells than the $20 he's going to pay. Or to say it in real simple English, you produce more than you get paid. So if you said to yourself, or you heard some proud person say, I will never work for anyone who doesn't pay me what I'm worth, you're talking to a person who doesn't understand how the system works. You were never paid what you were worth, and you cannot and will not be in a capitalist system. Why? Because the difference between what your labor adds to the value that your employer sells and what he pays you is his profit. And it's why he's in business. And if you don't generate that profit for him, he's got no use for you. It's nothing personal. It's just business. It's the capitalist form of business. So for the American people, the vast majority of whom come home every day with a vague sense of having been ripped off at the job, they're exactly right. It's just they haven't had the course yet to be able to understand why they feel that way and why they ought to. The closest we get to them, pardon me, pardon me for those of you who've heard me do this joke before, the closest we get as a culture to recognizing it is that peculiar tradition we have of the name we give for the two hours immediately at the end of the workday. The two hours that are advertised in that window we pass on the way home from the job, which tells us if we come inside, we can have a happy hour underscoring how different it is from the previous hours. <laughs> Marx, who figured this all out, neatly, clearly, right from the beginning of Das Kapital, the early chapters, he lays this out. Exactly what I just did, the words are different. Uh, he spoke German. So, Marx says, this creates in the worker a sense of being, my language, not his, ripped off, his language, alienated. He's constantly producing for somebody else. Not by will, not by choice, not by design, but by a system he has no choice or she has no choice but to engage to survive. You need that wage and salary because otherwise this system doesn't treat you very well. This weighs on you. This eats at your self-concept. It eats at your sense of achievement. You may repeat to yourself, as people do under these circumstances, that you're not going to work unless you get paid what you're worth. But you have to repeat it because somewhere you know it's not true. And that's hard to fix. And then on top of it, you're caught up in a system in which the employer has every incentive and every interest to squeeze the part that's paid to you, thereby increasing what's left over for him in what you produce. Get more out of you, give less to you. It's endless, isn't it? 
get you to do a little task extra, get you to go quicker to the bathroom, make sure you come on time and don't leave early. You get the picture? Always, always. And if there's a machine that can make you more productive or make you more necessary, oh boy, will it be engaged quickly. Impact on you? Who cares? You spend the best days and the best hours of your adult life in an institution that tells you in a thousand ways, I don't give a shit about you. You're here to produce profit for me. End of story. Don't ever forget it. Maybe you have an employer who doesn't put it quite like that. But how important is it how it's put? It is the reality. That's a terrible thing to impose on human beings. In its own way, it's terrible like slavery. To divide the population into masters, the small number, and slaves, the vast majority, and to make the slave not only the producer of everything that gets made, but to give all of that to the master, who then decides to give some enough back to the slave, to keep him alive, to keep her going, Sometimes more, sometimes less. Horrible way to live. And then you are the property of the master altogether. Wow. That's even worse. In capitalism, of course, you are, as Marx loved to say, free. And here's what the freedom means. You can leave the employer and go find another one hoping against hope that the other one won't treat you as nastily as the one you just left did. A long shot and a very constricted notion of what freedom means. You're not free to be other than an employee. The whole notion of employer-employee is a horrific prison into which to thrust the majority of people. And that's what capitalism has always done. <coughs> it's a bizarre idea, and it mocks history. We overthrew slavery because the master-slave relationship was understood to be horrific. We replaced it in many cases with the feudal system. Until then, again, we decided as a species that the Lord Surf while better than master-slave, was not enough. Well, guess what? Master-slave is a dichotomy, a way of splitting the people involved in production into two very unequal partners. Feudalism is another. And for those of you who haven't already figured it out, capitalism is just a different form of the same dichotomy. It just calls it employer-employee rather than lord, serf, or master and slave. There's a reason Marx referred to workers in capitalism as wage slaves. He wanted people to see a parallel. We shouldn't forget. Two other dimensions of capitalism imposition on us as human beings. First, inequality. And it's appropriate now, as Bob pointed out, because it's extreme. I want you all to enjoy, if you can, the spectacle in this society, comparable to anything out of uh, pharaohs in Egypt thousands of years ago. <coughs> Jeffrey and Mackenzie Bezos. Mr. Bezos has a great achievement. He delivers packages. He's a stunningly effective package deliverer. And in a society like ours, who should more deserve fantastic wealth than a package deliverer? That's how capitalism works. He delivers packages, or let me be fair, quickly. He delivers them quickly. His wealth about $160 billion. Enough money to erase 
many of the social problems we have in this country. If put to a better use than the personal property of Jeff Jesus. He did what so many of his fellow business tycoons did, uh, but not with his wife. And so that relationship came to an end. And they got divorced, which I believe is finalized this week. That's why I'm picking this topic. She will get 39 billion out of his 160. By having 160, he ranks number one on the Bloomberg billionaires list. Those of you that want to keep track of this. She, because he has to give her at least half an hour, she now becomes number 22 on the list with her 39. So this is not an appeal for money for them. Uh, clearly, they don't need it. By the way, you know, if you get have 160 billion and you invest it in U.S. Treasuries at about three percent, it means you're getting four or five billion bucks a year automatically, which is why you get richer and richer. Uh, excuse me, they do, you don't. This is a crazy system. Mr. Bezos is using that money to develop rockets that will take him to the moon. He understands the risks of the future in America, even in the rest of the world. He's prepared to go somewhere else. <laughs> we can wait as he leaves. There is no justification for this in cost. There never was. What he has is therefore not available for this society. What he has is disposed of as he sees fit to whomever he sees fit to give it. That's not democracy. Democracy says the wealth we all help produce, we would all participate in deciding how to make use of. We don't have that. We give a wildly disproportionate amount of wealth to a tiny group. 10% of the American people own 84% of the stocks and bonds. And there was a people's capitalism but to use such phrases today is to mock the reality in a cruel way. The third thing that capitalism does, besides dividing us into exploiter and exploited on the one hand, rich and poor on the other, is instability. We are still reeling, as is the whole world, with the consequences of the collapse of global capitalism in 2008 and 9. That peculiar quality of capitalism in which periodically millions of people doing their jobs are thrown out of work. Millions, millions of enterprises chugging along, making goods and services go belly up. Vast quantities of output that could have been made available to solve our problems aren't being produced. Think of the, the lunacy of it. Everybody hates the downturn. The business community, the working class, the unions, the government, everybody is against it, and nobody seems able to do anything about it. We have had downturns every four to seven years in every country where capitalism has become the dominant system, without exception. Every now, that's an average four to seven years. So every now and then, a, a, a capitalist economy can kind of be chugging along even more than seven years. Usually, when then the, the collapse comes two, three, four years later, it's even worse because it has gone longer than normal. Which is why the American financial press today, if you read it, which I am unfortunately required to do, is agonizing over the next downturn. Because we're over seven years since the last one, 2008. You know who's worried most about it? Mr. Trump. Because he can kiss his election goodbye if it happens too soon. So he's putting pressure on the Federal Reserve to get those interest rates down, to get us all to borrow more money, to postpone the downturn until after the election when he could give a crap. You live in what I've just described. 
that capitalism messes up your life? You haven't figured that out? Of course you have. It's just hard to face. And no one has a harder time than the people whose job it is to face it and deal with it. The Republicans and the Democrats. And on these issues, the difference between them is trivial. Have we had downturns every four to seven years in America? Uh huh. Have they solved the problem? Not even close. They pretended they did after the terrible one in the 1930s. Oh, we fixed it. Until 2008, when that horse shit couldn't be sold anymore. No, we haven't fixed it. Our politics is driven by it. All we have developed is a series of arguments to blame somebody else. Something else, not the capitalist system, that works like this. Oh no, it's Arab oil. Oh no, it's China. Oh no, it's Russia. Oh no, come up with something. Anything other than the system. And that's my final point. We live in a society in which unbelievable amounts of energy, creativity, and money are devoted to one fundamental task. Keep the anger, the rage, the upset, the hurt that capitalism provokes from leading people to identify capitalism as the problem. Come up with anything else. It's the family. What? It's the lack of Moral education among the young. Huh? What? It's the Chinese. We had a debate. The Republicans have decided the Russians are good, the Chinese are bad. The Democrats have decided that the Chinese are good, and the other way around. I can't even keep it straight. Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. These are games. We think we can work a deal with the Iranians. Oh, we don't think we can. Stop. These are efforts to constantly focus you elsewhere. A nation of 325 million Americans, which includes 10, maybe 12 at the outside, million undocumented immigrants, has figured out that the problem that we need to put number one to fix our economy is the beat up and literally kill the immigrants. We're about to celebrate a 4th of July with a Statue of Liberty not far from here, which says we welcome the poor, the hungry, the huddled masses yearning to be free as we slaughter them. This is a society that's spun out of control, whose fakery to itself it reaches such extremes that it's easy for me to take these 15 minutes and sketch it for you. That tells you how far gone it is. There's only one real issue, in my opinion, for the American people. They finally got to stop pointing fingers somewhere else and figure out that allowing an economic system to exist that behaves this way, that puts as its leader a person whose lack of appropriateness for the job is so grotesquely on display every day, the whole world kind of shakes its head in stunned disbelief. You're supposed to have a veneer. That's why you have Ivy League schools. You learn how to not show that sort of thing. <laughs> the system requires it, but you have to disguise it. The system is an extremist, and so it can It actually needs clowns theater performers to distract people. Let's get angry at Mr. Trump. What are you got for? But he's gone. There's one more like that. There's no shortage. England is about to put into office their Mr. Trump. The Italians already done it. Boris Johnson in England, for those of you, pay attention. It's just another Trump. Similarly patterned. We'll never figure out who copied who. These are disaster signs. 
That's why I can go back to the beginning. Yes, this is another capitalist crisis. Yes, we will have a downturn in the next 12 to 18 months. Everybody who pays attention knows that. But that's a system that's an extremist. We don't know when capitalism will die, but we do know that it will, because every other system of economics the world has ever had were born, evolved over time, and then they died. That's what happened to slavery, that's what happened to feudalism, that's what happened to ancient, ancient tribal economic systems, and so on. Capitalism, we know, was born. Capitalism, we know, has evolved. The next step is obvious. It's not whether. It's just when. And how much damage will its demise impose on the rest of us? Thank you. supplements in our very scarce labor market. 
one for their whiteness and one for their maleness. Those wages were given because there was a very scarce labor market, made the more scarce in our sexist, racist nation. There was also a strong union movement that could push up wages. That ended in the 1970s. And Americans have been in days despair over that ending until very recently when people wake, are waking up. In the 1970s, things changed. The jet engine was discovered. Computers came into being. Sophisticated international communication systems allowed people to communicate overseas. Advanced mechanization and robotization allow jobs to be replaced. And the weakened labor market didn't fight the outsourcing that followed. American corporations with these wonderful new inventions exported well-paid industrial jobs to China and India where they could be sure that the workers would be paid less than $4 an hour, have no labor rights, and have no ecological protection and no pensions. Huge profits were accumulated, which, by the way, were brought back home to by the media and the politicians. Another factor that allowed this was the labor movement's cooperation with McCarthyite anti-communism. The unions threw out their communist and socialist left, who were, parenthetically, among their most militant, most diligent, and best organizers that they had. Therefore, there wasn't a huge union and labor fight against the outsourcing that stole their jobs, the way the communist and socialist unions fought in France, in Germany, and in Scandinavia. That's how come the German metal workers just won a contract for 22 hours a, a week's work at the same pay that they used to get so they could get home life balance. Wow, that isn't where labor is at in the United States. So all these forces allowed usually male jobs in manufacturing to be outsourced, where huge profits could be made, because that's what it's all about in the capitalist system. Not nurturing the nation, but making money for yourself and your board of directors. And that's all recent economic history. That has drastically altered, altered relationships between people. Because the family wages that ended in the 1970s were the basis of the dependent wife and children and the wage earning white man. That's over. And with it is the stability that came that with dating and love and marriage and family. Because that family is no longer able to be supported. Now, losing that family is hardly a total loss. It's a mixed bag. That family was stable and predictable, but often a life sentence as well as a life commitment. <laughs> Until death do us part. It was stifling particularly for women. In 1963, Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, described this mystique, how American women could be so dissatisfied and unhappy when they could find fulfillment through housework, marriage, sexual passivity, and childbearing, and attention to a man. Big mystery. How could they want engagement outside the home? At that time, the psychologically healthy woman was a woman with children and a totally fulfilling job supporting her husband and raising her children. The jokes of that time summarized it the way jokes do so well. The joke for men was there's a handy little thing called a wife. You screw it on the bed, it does all the housework, all the child care, takes care of you when you're sick, and 
is there for sex too. Wow, good idea, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The equivalent for the female joke was men are like linoleum. You lay them right once, you can walk on them and they'll support you for 20 years. <laughs> Jokes capture the reality that people don't want to say outright, so they hide it under humor and they can laugh. Battered women had no recourse. Furious, confined men and women often took out their rage on children. Child abuse wasn't even legally recognized until 1974, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, which bolstered battered women's shelters and child abuse reporting and protective services. That family, with its marriage for life, at least was stable. At, at that time, in those families, children had a hopeful society to look forward to. America won in World War II. We were the only surviving economy. Doors were opening. Employment was there and so people could recoup themselves from their family drown. Within today's economy of outsourcing and job scarcity, everything is precarious. The stable male jobs that supported families, however unhappy, is over. Young people can't even plan on having a planet, no less a job they can count on. And what's very interesting is the new developments are that people rent their furniture. They rent their pictures in their house. They rent their clothes at the, run, the runway and other stores because they know they'll have to leave and they want to pack everything in a car when they leave because they don't have stability. So and that's another thing. If and when people do manage to connect and settle down, they face a majority chance that they'll get divorced. 50% of legal marriages now end in separation, legal separation or divorce. That's double what it was in the 60s and early 70s. Another 15 to 20% split. They don't have assets or kids that they want to fight over. They make a mutual agreement, which they may or may not keep, and they split. So we're talking about 65 to 75% of marriages. It's mainly now women who refuse marriage. That old stereotype of the woman dragging the man to the altar, forget it. It's over. 80% of divorces are now initiated by women. They don't want to have to do full domestic, sexual and emotional jobs for men who won't share those jobs at home while they go out to work. Interestingly enough, unemployed men married to employed women still do less housework than their wives. So now that working women are the majority, 75% of mothers work outside the home for the first time in America, young people are refusing marriage, particularly young women. For the first time in America, the majority of people that they call a reproductive age, 18 to 35, aren't married. That's a big change. And, you know, it's also summarized in a humorous thing. I was telling my daughter about the old saw to keep women virginal. Why buy the cow if you could get the milk for free? And she said to me, hey mom, you know what I say? Why bring a pig in your house if all you want is sausage? <laughs>
root. <laughs> but um, these couples can afford to farm out what were traditional women's tasks. They get housekeepers to do their work. They get nannies. They get daycare. They get after school programs and lessons for their kids. They get summer camp when the kid is a little older. They get paid vacations, which aren't available to most people in America. These things allow them to have the space. And also, of course, they can get therapy when things get rough in our difficult system. <laughs> so that those people who are married can stay married with these helps. And now, for the first time, 57% of U.S. households are households without children. And the latest development in married couples is married couples who don't want children and don't have them. However, some people do want children. Many women want children, but not men. So, now 42% of children are born outside of marriage. 42%. In 1970, before male jobs were outsourced, 13.5% of U.S. children were born outside of a marriage. Black men were never given family wages. Therefore, even in 1970, 24% of black children were born outside of a marriage, whereas only 3% of white children were born outside of a marriage. In 1970, Patrick Moynihan made a treatise on his fan, on what is the family and what is the problem with the black family. It's a parallel with Charles Murray's book in 2012 about family. They both decided within the capitalist ideology that the problems were immorality of the people involved. Patrick Moynihan discovered the pathology of the black family that makes their men unreliable and abandoning children. Not that they can't support them because they can't get a family wage. That was not part of the discussion. Charles Murray did the same thing for whites, saying working class white men have become immoral and lazy, and that's why their marriages are resolving. Capitalism's responsibility was excised from the discourse, as it is in popular American culture. However, we do have to face that although the family is questionable, and it really was born out of capitalism and born out of a necessity to make every man a feudal ruler of his household and to give to women support in pregnancy and have children as chattel. And I can talk to you about that if you want to ask questions later. It's a big discussion. However, in spite of its rapid dissolution, the family is the only basic emotional and child-rearing institution we have. So we can't really give up on family. We can work on developing alternatives, but we can't give up on it. So what can we do to make relationships last and marriage and child-rearing easier for people? Well, we could do what almost every other developed, well, every other developed nation does to support families. We could give paid maternity and paternity leaves. We are one of four nations that does not do that. And the other three are Papua New Guinea, Swaziland, Somalia, and, um, let's see, United States, Swaziland, Somalia, and what was the last one? Somalia. Papua New Guinea, which I mentioned at first. So, we're not in good company here. We're in the company of desperately poor states, some of which, like Somalia, are crumbling. Well, let's look at our European equals or near equals, although they're not as rich as us in the developed world. There is universal child care starting at three years old in quality centers in France, and those quality centers have Teachers with master's degrees, they're paid on the same education level as other teachers, whereas here, child care workers are paid the equivalent of parking lot attendants, some of the worst paid people in the United States. 
They also have an assistant teacher with an associate's degree. They have a paid nurse on the staff in case kids get sick, and they have a sick room, so parents can work even though the kids are not well. They also, and France is just as mixed race a society and mixed wealth a society as the United States, so they're the best in Paris. They also have universal after school and summer care, which can't be more than 15% of your salary. They have subsidies for single parents, clothing subsidies for school and other things. The best on that is Sweden, where single mothers make 98% of what men earn. Whereas in the United States, if you look at what women earn versus men at any point, it's 81 cents of a man's dollar. If you look at the 15-year trajectory of women's lives, where we take time out to take care of children and relatives, we make 42% over a lifetime. 42% of what men earn, if you look at a 15-year slice. We could also have free medical care, free college, the way most other developed countries do. We could have low-cost, healthy McDonald's restaurants that have little prizes, snacks, playgrounds and healthy low-cost food. And vegan. And vegan for those who want it. We spend a trillion dollars a year on the military. What? And we're losing every war. We're losing in Afghanistan. We're losing in Iraq. We're in 130 countries. And we're not doing well. What is this? A boom to the military in which we're the top producers? Mm -hmm. Looks like it. We're the richest nation in the world, and we provide the least support for our families. We could pull the rug out of the religious rights commitment to family while they try to while they try to erode every support that we advocate, from abortion rights and a chosen family to birth control to universal child care to family leaves. The left could stand up with a family program and a personal life program, which is possible, just not possible with our capitalism. And of course we could do it. Here the left has really made a huge mistake, ceding that territory of family and relationships to the right, which erodes the economic basis for those relationships while talking about their importance. We could do that. We could pull that right wing's moralistic rug right out from under them. Let's do it. Required 
have struggled to move beyond that economically and culturally. There are at least three interconnected systems of hierarchy. Capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy. These systems valorize power from extracted wealth, male dominance, and whiteness, whatever that is. Capitalism effectively integrates and builds upon all of these systems. The United States history is marked by the people of the African diaspora's ongoing struggle to break free from the legal and the economic and the social status of being defined as property, from the violence used to keep us in our place, and the stress of being forced to live under institutions that feed these conditions day after day. When your kids are routinely shot by the police, your schools have no resources and convey your children to prison by design. And people look at you on the subway or the street as though you define the lowest rung in the society. How did this happen? The interlocking systems of patriarchy and capitalism and white supremacy did their work, dehumanizing and converting other people to their use. A prime example of a servant institution of patriarchal white supremacy capitalism is the enforcement prison punishment system. I wish it could be said that we move beyond the slave patrols and the role in protecting white property. It sometimes feels like we're living in an endless adaptation of the Scottsboro Boys or Emmett Till and a thousand other personal tragedies. This is the horror of Eva DuVernay's account of the roundup of the Central Park Five, when they see us, which follows the legacy of hunting down people like animals, wild and boys, treating pe people like dogs. The thoughtless violence extends to Trayvon Martin and Philando Castile to today. By now, black people know that the police are deployed to protect the peace and the property and the interests of white citizenry. And when we think about the way in which authority has been used throughout history, the Pinkertons, security agents paid to protect the corporate property of the railroad magnets of the Robert Baron era, the parallels are clear. Consider the way in which police are used today as a prelude to displacement by conducting sweeps and moving out the poor living in areas like Bedford Stuyvesant and now Brownsville targeted for development and resettlement by real estate magnets. And as Marxist political economist Rushen Kirchhoff noted, the punishment system, like all institutions, evolves and adapts to changing economic conditions, like emancipation and social mandates to uphold the purity condition of the United States as a mythic white nation to contain its black non-citizens. Today, even as people work to slow the operation of criminalizing black and poor people, there remain over 2.3 million persons incarcerated in the U.S. punishment system. 60% in the federal system are black and brown. Over 70% in New York are black and brown in the state system. And in Rikers at its peak, it was close to 90%. How do we get here? As you know, the U.S. emerged in 1790, that prison system, from an anti-aristocratic social dynamic that followed the American and the French revolutions. And this led to bringing punishment inside, outside from public view and into the prison. This was in marked contrast to earlier public execution events like hanging that operated to display the power of the state and become provocative to the sensibilities of common people. This became an irritant. Prisons were also used to address the establishment's fear of new immigrants, then Irish and German, who arrived to feed the rapidly expanding U.S. labor market and was used to contain perceived social disruptors, meaning free blacks, the poor, the immigrant newcomers, often lower caste, who were viewed as dangerous to the existing established order. It should be noted that slaves were very prevalent in the North and were frequently employed as skilled labor on behalf of their owners. And in fact, Lehman Brothers invested
listed in slaves along with the other commodities. Right, uh, this yeah, thank you. Thank you. Once punishment was moved inside, prison processes, as described by Michel Foucault on this point, punish. They were used as a kind of a training ground to indoctrinate persons into the routines of early industrial capitalism, waking people at 5 a.m. with bells and horns for a day of closely supervised work. Their labor was used to subsidize the operation of the prison. That was the opera model. But the degree of energy and labor extraction could not compare to the post-Civil War conditions where the incarceration project was to contain and target emancipated black people who had yet to establish that they were human beings. Now you all remember that Dred Scott had only been decided in 1857, and the main quote from that is, the white, yeah, let me get this right, the black man possesses no rights that the white man is bound to respect. Following emancipation, as we know, the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution justified returning people, almost exclusively black, to the condition of slavery through incarceration. In the South, the legal system worked in tandem with the punishment system to accomplish this objective by enacting black codes and other laws that criminalized acts like loitering and pig theft and applying hyperinflated sentencing that led through the operation of the convict lease and chain gang systems. As many of you may probably know, the convict lease system subsidized the southern economy until 1928, and that's when it ended in Alabama. And it periodically keeps rearing its head. Uh, Joe Arpaio in Arizona tried to reinstitute it again in 1995. And here's where mostly black convicted persons were leased to private companies engaged in incredibly dangerous work like mining or pine tar extraction or railroad construction. And you should know that at least 60 to 70 percent of the persons in these conditions died. There's a book by a Professor Mancini, One Died, Get Another. That's really the description of the convict lease system. Its successor system, the chain gang, was responsible for building over 70% of the southern roads in this country. So we see, not only was the wealth of white individuals built by owning and using and selling slaves, but so was white societal wealth. When we talk about how the average wealth of a white family in the U.S. is close to 10 times that of a black family, these are its roots. And so in many ways, the capitalist economy was built on the subordination of black people. And so was the concept of the white working class. As Steve Martino and David Roediger highlight, white supremacy in the United States led to its economic formation and its class identity, particularly in unions like the AFL-CIO, where the whole notion of being in a union was being skilled and white. And the split among working people that could be defined as worker has led to the weakness of the labor movement see today. So following emancipation in the late 19th century, white society attempted to further contain blacks by establishing a formal apartheid state. And I'm sure you all remember Plessy versus Ferguson. This was decided in 1896. Basically, that's a Supreme Court case that inaugurated the new Jim Crow, the state-sponsored apartheid system. And throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, apartheid and destruction were justified by narratives of black male predatory sexuality targeting white women. These narratives, among others, served to justify purging black people from towns and cities, as in Atlanta's race riot in 1906. And even when blacks stepped out of the box, and they got out of their destitution, and they formed their own thriving communities like Wilmington, North Carolina, or Tulsa, Oklahoma, white mobs acted en masse to destroy and burn them. So after all of the violence and the repressive social atmosphere following World War I, blacks attempted to migrate away from the extractive labor practices secured by violence, dead peonage, sharecropping, convict lease, chain gang. And this happened all during the first and the second migrations from 1915 to 1940, 
1940 to 1970. But when they arrived in the North, this is what they encountered. Laws and practices designed to protect white space and interests by restrictive covenants and redlining and renewal targeting selective communities. Legislation that expressly omitted the vast majority of black workers, which at that time were farmers and domestics, from being covered under social security and unemployment insurance and minimum wage laws. Even after blacks gave their lives in World War II and its aftermath, blacks were once again contained in small areas in these ghettos, often through this urban renewal plan. Banks would not lend money to blacks to buy houses in prime areas for investment because of the redlining practices. And blacks could not take full advantage of legislation like the GI Bill, which was designed to make education and loans and housing easier for veterans. That's right. Thank you. So the experience of black people in the United States illustrates how the forces of white supremacy acted through and beyond capitalism and how containment practices were linked to the expansion of the criminalization of black and brown people and the institutions of containment which became mass incarceration. So how did this work? Our apartheid conditions have created a fundamental divide between whites and blacks. At the same time, following the Great Migrations, more blacks were living in the north and in cities like Detroit, and Philadelphia, and Chicago, and so the containment apparatus needed to grow. The demands of the civil rights movement and the black power and anti-war movements fed a sense of urgency about containing black and radical people in the 60s. So following the rebellions in northern cities culminating after the assassination of Dr. King and the Democratic National Convention of 1968, the conservative movement that galvanized around the presidency of Barrel, of that, that candidacy of Barry Goldwater in 1964, led to a refrain of this call to law and order. And that meant really contain the black and the radical people. As it happened, the emerging legal justification for building up the punishment system to immobilize black people and disruptive white people was drugs. Drug use was presented as an acceptable justification for acting to restore social order. The state further criminalized drugs, but then labeled the black population as the major users, and they're, they're the group of the problem. And at the same time, the FBI flooded drugs into the black community so blacks could be arrested for the possession of drugs. New laws, like the Rockefeller Drug Law, secured long prison terms for, for drug users and sellers, requiring the building of new prisons, it was argued, which were all situated, by the way, in the upstate economy, in the upstate New York region, that's right. Were they all white? All the prison guards are white? Oh, oh. Yeah, well, thank you. It was an economic boost to a flagging section of that state. And you'll see it in other states across the country where they develop prisons. It's an injection to feed a lot of those interests. At the same time, institutions that operated to separate black families grew under the compelling crisis of crack cocaine. In the it is worth noting that the recent opioid crisis that initially affected most white people is now being a public health crisis. After the devastation of mass incarceration and the effect of racialized unemployment where blacks are on average unemployed at twice the rate of white, white people, the real estate interest in New York City became interested again in capitalizing on New York City development. And they're doing so with a vengeance. The white upper class and international capital are resettling city land that they abandoned in the 1960s and 70s when the president declared that the Bronx was burning. Doing so by mass displacement policies through real estate investment and once again, hyper enforcement and incarceration. The result, according to the census, large numbers of black brown and poor people migrated out of New York City. In the last 10 years, over a million people have left New York since 2010. Instead of providing resources to help people self-determine and remain in their communities and treat historic
historical trauma arising from the violence and the deprivation and the demonizing narratives of inferiority, black people and brown are having to scramble once again to find a place where they can afford to remain, where they can build and sustain a community. That's the reasons that reparations is so current in today's dialogue, and the reason to me that the most urgent work that can be done is to build black community resources and power through communal ownership. How could we possibly make whole the extensive, long-ranging damage arising from enslavement extending to today? This is because these harms have damaged black bodies as people, emotional beings, barring them from access to education and union membership and the tools needed to function in this society and to fully participate in the life of the community. The inability to develop an adequate remedy is no excuse for the failure to begin to develop these supports. So let's do that work together. Job creators. 
There it is. This is, a, this is a branding game. If capitalism is strong, it puts a lipstick on its own pig and hopes thereby to obscure that it's a pig. And the job of all of us, among other things, is, is to break all that down, to call it for what it is, to denounce it for what it's doing. That the richest man on earth, for whom $4 billion would be chunk change, could demand of a city that has some of the dirtiest subways on the planet, that it not take care of its own infrastructure, but instead give this immense company and its rich for another four billion. It's, it is beyond words. And I think the majority of American people, if we get out there and make these arguments, will be surprisingly open and sympathetic to them. <coughs> that ideology that celebrates capitalism by carefully avoiding looking at its costs, that's what stimulated this panel. Let's look at these costs. Their economics, their, their, their personal, their racial dimensions. I think if you present this material, each of us in our own language, our own vocabulary, there's a, there's a whole world out there waiting to do. If Lee Carter can be the socialist representative in the Virginia legislature, just like that election, if I understand it, outcome in Queens with the district attorney. Things are shifting. It's our moment and be very sad if we did not grab it. We've got to get to an order. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Um, ma'am? Um, I'm Ray Ray If you've to a person, please identify the candidate. Yes, Richard. Um, I read where Elizabeth Warren was asked whether she was a capitalist or a socialist, or you know, what she considered. She said, no, I'm very much of a capitalist. I just believe it needs to work for everyone. And we know her plans are, she has like, you know, universal child care, um, education, all kinds of wonderful ideas. I'm just wondering, I mean, Bernie would probably call that democratic socialism, because he has a lot of the same ideas. But do you think it's possible within capitalism that those ideas could come to be? It's not surprising that a system in trouble wants folks to believe that, okay, so there are problems, we can fix them. We don't have to challenge the system. I'm not surprised. People in a, in a compromised, crisis-ridden institution, whatever it is, don't jump from living in it and celebrating it to overthrowing it. There's intermediate steps, and one of them used to be called, what you're referring to, capitalism with a human face. We, we don't want capitalism harsh, Trump-like. We want nice capitalism. We've had nice capitalism. That's what emerged out of the Great Depression of the 1930s. That's when Social Security was created. That's when unemployment compensation was created. That's when a federal job system was created. With all its faults, and race was one of the big four areas of the, of the New Deal. It was capitalism with the human face. But let's remember, that was created by an upsurge of folks from below. The CIA, two socialist parties, and the Communist Party of the United States made that happen. That was not a gift of capitalists, smartly. After it was forced on the capitalists, they turned around and tried to sell to the American people, to many of them, see how nice capitalism can be? As if they, in their generosity, had given us something. They didn't. It was forced on them. Go back and look at what happened in the Congress around Social Security, unemployment, the conservative business community through both the Republican and Democratic Party fought against it tooth and nail. But it's clever to claim when you've lost, oh no, we didn't lose, we have given. That's why the 50s, 60s, and 70s were full of this notion, isn't capitalism wonderful? It has created a middle class. It didn't create crap. That was forced on them. And as soon as they could, that's what the last 40 years have shown us, 
They undid it. Here's the fundamental problem with, with her, Elizabeth Warren. Not that these ideas you write, that those are all positive, we would all support them. But we've been there before and done that. We have reformed the capitalism to make it work better. But if you don't take the power away from the capitalists, they will take it back within 15 months of the time you finally get it done. Reform versus revolution, that issue has been resolved. We've done reform. That's what the 1930s did. And what the time since then has shown us that if you don't change the system, it will take back whatever you may have the strength to force it to do. That's why revolution is necessary. That's why you have to take the control of the wealth of this country away from a capitalist class that has used and abused it and brought us to this situation. Go to London, you'll see that there 
there are sizable numbers of people who think that small, wet, offshore island from Europe is the center of the world. They can't let it go. And it's killing them. Brexit is one of the last steps of that miserable decline. And Boris Johnson replacing the, the already catastrophic Theresa May is a sign of the end. The only question for the United States is whether we'll have a different way of adjusting to capitalism doing to us what we used to, in the name of capitalism, do to everybody else. health 
telephone, if it's whatever it is, that's an act of creative resistance. And I think it, it's very important for black and brown and all people to be able to do that. Thank you for your question. It has different parts. One of them is what I mentioned about Chad. There's a very good book, although it's turgid prose, and he's a French intellectual, Jacques Dolzelot, called Policing the Family, where he meticulously shows the process where after the French Revolution, things were chaotic. <laughs> and the aristocracy remains, the remains of the aristocracy, the remains of the Catholic Church, who were also huge landowners with serfs, and the new capitalists got together because they were trying to counter the popular demand of the French Revolution that childbearing be funded by the state and change. There were children in the barricades, there were parents who no longer wanted to be saddled with that personal responsibility. So these people who were the only people to, that could be taxed to finance that, didn't like that idea. And they made a deal. We will change the family, because the old feudal family had crumbled once the serfs left the land and went to the cities. So that that was no longer possible. So they decided to divide it, to give each man the possibility of being a feudal lord of his own household, to give women the security of protection in childbirth, because people were fucking around and there was no protection for the women or the children at that time. And allow both of them chattel children who could be rented out and abused as they saw fit. Okay. That was enforced because they didn't, in those desperate times, no one was allowed to be employed unless they were in that family configuration of the dependent wife and children. And then a wage was given to the male. And people were desperate for work. That hasn't been as meticulously researched in other nations as it was excuse me, in France. That's what happened. Now, what to do with the family now, the second part of your question. First of all, there are alternatives in the United States. There's co-housing, which is very popular, where people have a tract of land with a lot of apartments, some with children, some without children. People have ways of signaling each other whether they want the kids to drop in or whatever. And different lifestyles are there in a communal fashion. Although everyone has his or her own apartment. Nations like Sweden are building housing that acknowledges that people stay single longer so that people have small single apartments and then big collective spaces where they're encouraging people to be a collective, to see one another, to socialize with one another, to be together in their spare time, which worked very well. They, all of these nations, recognize the problem. The United States doesn't recognize the problem because we always counted on immigrants for their children because it takes a generation of immigrants to catch on that children don't pay in the society. And so there are a lot of children. Now our population is going down. We have the lowest fertility we have had since the Great Depression of the 30s. But they are not doing anything to change the family structure that would allow families to exist because they have supports. Sweden's done a great job on that. In their housing, fostering collectivity, and in their allowances to single mothers, and their connections to single mothers. France has done a much better job. Germany is now beginning to catch on. The United States is very backward because we always counted on a new population of new immigrants. And that's not happening. More Mexicans are going home than coming here, in spite of Trump saying the reverse. And so we do have to find forms, but we first have to recognize the problem 
which other nations have recognized, and we haven't. And that collectivity is not only for families, it's for the other side of when your family's older. There was an experiment that was very successful and therefore discontinued, where they took single room occupancy hotels, redid them beautifully, it was done in one location, into small apartments and big collective spaces. They found the Medicare bills went way down because they were for seniors, because people were doing things together, running the place together, having events together, and their little room was only a place to sleep. All over San Francisco, but only for the rich because it's expensive, you could get a tiny little apartment with a big collective space, counting on the fact that big people are single and need each other. So these alternatives are all out there and all possible. It's the awareness of them and the insistence to implement them, particularly on the left that has ceded that whole territory to the right. Huge mistake. We have 10 minutes. Uh, there are two gentlemen in the back, the lady on the edge, the lady in the front, okay? And I want to speak to what Dr. Director just said, too. Well, we have other people that have a hand. Taking what you can, when you can get 
get it. Or you might be so discouraged, here comes African Americans, by the very treatment you just cited, that you have basically said, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to be humiliated another time as I seek work. So I will go and do what? Off the books work, under the table work, illegal work. Uh, you could name it. There's lots of opportunities in our culture for all kinds of reasons. And so what you have is the irony that we have a lower, it goes the number if you're interested, labor force participation rate. That's what the government calls it. That's the percentage of people who are either employed or looking. That percentage dropped like a stone in 2008 and has still not gotten back to what the level was then because millions of people are no longer in the labor force. They ought to be called unemployed because that's what they are in most cases. But the way we set up this statistic, it doesn't do that. Now, Trump didn't originally have that existed before Trump. But it gives him an opportunity to point at low numbers as if it meant all the unemployed have found work. Not the case. Second thing to keep in mind, the wages have gone nowhere. And that's because good wage jobs were lost and never recovered. What we have are people who were unemployed from 2008 because of the crisis, the, the collapse, who first of all lived by using up their savings. When they ran out of those, they used up whatever resources their families had. When they finish with that, they become desperate. And now they give up the effort to get a job at the level they had before, and they enter the world of Walmart greeters. The worst jobs on earth, but they have to because they're desperate. They run out of unemployment qualification, and they run out of their own resources, and that's what we have, a nation of people taking jobs that are desperate, geeky, uh, other fake names to make you feel less awful about what has happened. But it's not the solution to the problem, it's a large evasion of it, which he can do, Trump can use as if he has achieved something, which is necessary since he's achieved nothing. Uh, next? You are. Okay. Um, speak loudly, please. Oh, yes. Yeah.
happens is people are put under enormous individual stress. And the only way that they can get rid of it is to join together and change the conditions. Just like women are put under stress when they're sexually assaulted. And when they take the shame out of themselves and point to their accusers and join together in Me Too or Time's Up, the stress goes. So that, and you can see unions are organizing here in a way that they haven't for many years. It's a way of taking the personal cost and saying, I don't have to bear this cost. We have to change these conditions. And that's what people have to do and are increasingly doing in the United States. It's the way out of taking it on, out on your own body. One more question? Okay. As each of you has laid out the costs of capitalism very we miss talking about the environmental uh, problems which are, are very grave and present a kind of urgency on top of all these urgent situations. Uh, and we have certainly uh, alluded to education, which is so important, and, and co-ops. We know uh, that that's a solution. And we talk about organizing within these various aspects of people's problems. Uh, but the other side of this is we have to take power away. And that's a whole leap um, into, into a, something that has to be dealt with. Um, and we, there were other sessions uh, talking about models uh, like Lenin's organization. But the, the urgency, uh, incremental solutions are important and, and have to take place. But um, how do we deal with the overwhelming problems that exist? A statement. When you put coal under stress, what do you get? All right. No, why you're under stress? Talk to me. The question of power is always there. How do you get from here to where we want to end up? One of the things that has been definitely in the left all around the world is that an old paradox, an old notion of how you solve the problem has been discredited. Rightly and wrongly, but it's been discredited. The idea of the left for the last hundred years is that the government steps in and solves the problem. The government takes away means of production from individuals and takes it over itself. The government plans the economy rather than letting it be handled by market transactions and all of that. For a whole lot of reasons, including the experiences of Russia and China, which are a mixed bag of very good and very bad things, that model is discredited. The mass of people have been persuaded, in my own judgment, correctly, but that's another matter. They've been persuaded that that model isn't the solution. That makes it very hard to organize, because you're organizing for what? Not that old thing, uh, we don't think that's the solution. Well then, what is the alternative? If you don't have an answer to that question, it's going to be very hard to organize a big party, a little party, a powerful party, a left-wing party, or anything, which is why the socialist parties around the world are as weak as they have become. Why in the midst of the biggest explosion of popular anger against capitalism, the Yellow Vest movement in, in France over the last year, remains unconnected to the existing left-wing parties because it doesn't see them as a mechanism because you don't know where that's going. We do have an answer, though. One of the reasons more and more of us are focusing on worker cooperatives is that it is a way to take the wealth and the control of wealth away from a small number of people who are capitalists and to democratize it to put it in the hands of the people who do the work, white and black and male and female, in a one person, one equal share, so that the decisions that we want to have politically are enforced by the fact that the people own the wealth, 
not some subsection that, surprising no one, keeps it in its own hands generation after generation. That is a program that the left would recommend and lead the transition from a top-down hierarchical capitalist system to a democratic worker cooperative way of organizing enterprises. Here's a plan, and that not, was not the plan of the last hundred years of the left. They, they either forgot about that or gave it a low priority. That's going to have to change, and that represents a new image of what socialism and the struggle for going beyond capitalism means tangibly. An immediate change in your life. You're not a drone. You don't go to work doing what other people tell you. You're part of what owns and operates and directs that enterprise just as you are a worker within it. You have both roles, both job descriptions, and you become a whole person rather than the drone that this system wants you to be. At the end of 65 years, you get a Timex watch.